remember he was sitting, this was outside, and there was a large, large group of devotees around. And uh, he looked at me. I mean, he just glanced in my direction, which seemed like he was looking at me. And I'll never forget that look. It looked like, you know, he was looking through me. And uh, I was thinking, oh my God, <laughs> he's seeing what I don't want him to see. <laughs> I was kind of, both it was, it was a nice experience in the fact that he noticed me, and the other time, the other half of it was, I'm afraid of what he's going to see. <laughs> so. The first time we saw Prabhupada, we'd come from Dallas to Los Angeles to get initiated, and Prabhupada was coming out of a car and going into his quarters, and we thought his effulgence filled the whole street, and, and everybody there had tears in their eyes. They couldn't help it. Uh, Prabhupada was not only so effulgent, but his love of Krishna was contagious. We all got a taste, a little glimpse of his ecstasy by just being with him. So the next morning was the day I was supposed to get initiated, and uh, I was in, after Mangalarti stringing neck beads. In, in those days, we didn't have beads on clasps. When you got initiated, you got, your neck beads were tied on you know, for life. So we were stringing our neck beads, and one devotee came and said, Oh, Prabhupada wants you on the morning walk. I said, what do I do? He said, well, you have to meet over here, um, the foot of Prabhupada's quarters. And I got there. At that time, the, what's now the Pujari room was a book room, book storage. And the one devotee said, well, where's your flower? I said, what do you mean flower? He says, you're going to greet Prabhupada? You have to have a flower. I said, where do I get? He said, just uh, find a flower. So I'm looking around, there's no flowers around like here. Now there's all many wonderful gardens, but there's nothing. So I found one little rose that was insignificant little rosebud, so I held it in my hand, and the waiting for Prabhupada came down the stairs. We all offer obeisances, and then they introduced me, and I again offered my obeisances to Prabhupada, and when I got up, they were gone. They walked out to get in the car. Well, they had this little Ford, that compact two-door car that said Hare Krishna on the side of it. Prabhupada was sitting in front, and I guess Karanda or somebody like that was driving the car, and there were four or five of us in the back seat. And I was in the bottom somehow. I'd gotten in, in there, and all these devotees were piled, and all wanted to go on the walk with Prabhupada. So I'm back there, and just as we pull in, pulling out uh, here on Venice Boulevard, a drunk guy, beard and kind of older, who had been in the temple earlier, and, and they'd thrown him out. So he was in there, some talk about it. I heard earlier in the morning about this guy. And he was sitting on the curb, very dejected. And when he sees the car with Prabhupada, and he looks up, and he goes, Hare Krishna, like that. And Prabhupada laughs in such a musical, contagious way. All of us in the car were just laughing hysterically, not knowing why exactly we were laughing, except that Prabhupada was laughing. And by his laughter, we, you know, we all were infected by it. So then on the ride to the beach, the morning Prabhupada asked me, he says, uh, what is God? Now, Mohanananda, you remember Mohanananda was had primed me. This is one of the questions Prabhupada might ask you. So I'd learned, you know, um, the, the supreme person complete in six opulences, all wealth, all beauty. So I had, <laughs> I'm kind of nervous, but uh, Prabhupada, the, 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 the God is the person. And so I started telling him the, the correct, what I thought was, he says, no, that's what we say. What do they say? And Prabhupada wanted to know what I'd learned as a theologian. I said, Prabhupada, they can't make up their mind. They have no idea who God is. And that's when he was at, down the walk, you know, you must defeat them. And he was like giving me that instruction to, these guys don't know who God is, but they're, therefore they're cheating the people, claiming they know God, and, and they don't. One morning, we had been uh, going on morning walks every morning with Shri Prabhupada. And uh, we were driving back in a car, and I said, uh, you know, Shri Prabhupada, you said that if a tree has fruit, then it becomes beautiful. And if a woman has a child, then she becomes beautiful. So I said, when does, does a disciple become beautiful? So I'm thinking, oh boy, this is such a nice question. It is such a nice, you know, such a nice metaphor. You know, just praising myself, oh, it's such a nice question. And Prabhupada immediately laced into me. Prabhupada said, oh, you have not read our books? What is the meaning of this verse? I don't know called Ihomoneash. What is the meaning? And I said, I don't know, 
Sri Prabhupada. Prabhupada looked at me and he said, hmm, parrot-like chanting. So, of course, I was driving and I could not jump out of the car. And there were sannyasis in the car. I think Brahmananda, Guru Kripa, everyone knows Brahmananda, Guru Kripa, they're all heavy duty. So they gave me the sannyasi look, like, <laughs> Sukade, what's he doing? Asking Prabhupada, this kind of course, the sour look. I'm like, oh, Krishna. <laughs> so then Prabhupada says, What is the meaning of this? Yes, the Prasada, Bhagavad Prasada. I said, By the mercy of the spiritual master, one gets the mercy of Krishna, Srila Prabhupada. Yes. Yeah. When the disciple is strictly following the order of the spiritual master, then he is beautiful. Otherwise, he is ugly. When the disciple is strictly following the orders of the spiritual master, then he is beautiful. Otherwise, he is ugly. So then I went to the back of the room, and then each boy came in one by one. And uh, Prabhupada met them. And then Prabhupada started to talk to us. He said, you're all our gems, my gems. You're all my gems. Because we were, he said, because you're 100% engaged in devotional service. You're all brahmacharis. And you're selling my books. And Srila Prabhupada said, you know, thank you very much. He said, just do your level-headed best. And then I just felt great relief because that party was a lot of pressure and the devotees really pushed us very hard. And it was like the anxiety of the gopis is they're always sweeping the floors even though there's no dust just to please Krishna. You know, <laughs> it was like they had this, and it's like spiritual anxiety is spiritual. You know, and they had us really hepped up to sell Prabhupada's books. When we met Prabhupada, Prabhupada said, just do your level-headed best. And that level-headed idea really sunk into me at the time. And I thought, this is logical. It's spiritual. This is the, what, this is the truth. Prabhupada's only wanting our level-headed best. And then Prabhupada thanked us. And then one devotee, he asked Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, if we die on Sankirtan, uh, will we go back home, back to Godhead? And Prabhupada said, Whatever state the mind is at the time of death, that state you'll attain. So if you think of Krishna and you're on Sankirtan and you die, you go back to Godhead. If you don't, then maybe not. So, but then Prabhupada, he got, this, he got the feeling everyone in the room just kind of went, you know, they're kind of like, you know, they didn't get the, the thing that they wanted. And then Prabhupada says, but I promise you this, if you distribute my books, until your dying day, Lord Chaitanya will personally come and take you back home, back to Godhead. I said, I promise you this. And then, ah. I was receiving my second initiation from Srila Prabhupada so that I could care for the deities. And, um, but I didn't know anything about Gayatri Mantra, and I didn't know that there was a way that you said it. So Prabhupada went like this to... He just went like this. And I didn't know what he was doing. So I just looked at him, and he went like this again. And I thought, oh, maybe he wants my beads. So I took my beads out of my bead, and he's like, no. So he took my hand in his hand and took my thumb and put, the, put my thumb on each of the places. And... Um, to show me how to chant the Gayatri Mantra. And many years later, and I, 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 I don't remember if I read it somewhere or heard it somewhere, but I became aware that there were times when the, the guru, knowing his disciple to be not pure enough to, to care for the deities, would touch that person to purify them enough to be with Krishna on the altar. So I, I felt very, oh, like, well, that makes sense. I certainly needed that purification. Then I started, uh, 
I forget, I forget exactly the point I, I started filming with probably in 16 millimeter. And uh, sometimes I, didn't, I wouldn't have film in the camera. But this was a trick I used to go out on the morning walks, you know, I'm filming, you know. Okay, film camera crew. <laughs> okay, you get a, so I would go out. There wasn't, wasn't any film, but so I was able to uh, associate with Proud like that. And, and there's walks in Mayapur also. He would, uh, just remember one thing, he, there was a pole sticking up and a path around it. And he said, uh, this is a griha. He said, that pole, it was a griha. And the bull is connected to that. That's why the path is around it. The bull is, he can't leave this area. <laughs> For all our, our macho grihastas out there, you know. <laughs> this one, connected to the pole. And then Prabhupada told us he wanted us all to be brahmacharis, never to marry. He said, if you all remain brahmachari, 90% chance of going back home, back to Godhead. He said, as soon as you get married, 50% chance. <laughs> so the devotees, he just, you know. And then Prabhupada said, as soon as you marry, uh, you must have an apartment. And once you get an apartment, you must put so many things inside. And if you're a brahmachari, you can sleep under a tree. On management uh, regarding, for example, the restaurant and cooking and managing the guest house, uh, some of the policies were uh, a little, uh, I found them to be a little strange, but then later on I could understand. For example, in Vrindavan, Prabhupada wanted three separate kitchens, uh, small little kitchens with a little uh, uh, oven, you know, one of those mud caked ovens or, you know, that's what we were using, wood and, and coal. So he said, these three, he said, uh, I, he told me that I don't want our life members to go outside to drink their tea. Let them brew their tea here if they want on their own. So you provide them, so we provided three small cubicles where they could actually make their tea and things like that, you know. So and initially, uh, you know, <laughs> you would think that, uh, you know, tea is, is an intoxicant and devotees are not supposed to take. And here is Prabhupada providing tea for the uh, guests and, and life members. And he told and so I asked Prabhupada, I said, okay, Prabhupada, you know, sometimes Devotees are very fanatic and they are saying, how can you do that? Because I don't want to mention names because it's, it's not necessary. So then he said, yes. Uh, when a guest comes to the house, then you try to fulfill all his wishes as long as it doesn't really involve sinful activities. So we may not drink it because it is a part of sadhana, but the is not drinking tea is not a sinful activity. It may be in the act, in the in a mode of ignorance, but certainly not a sinful activity. So there is no harm if you provide uh, tea for the guests. You know. Just before the class, there was a guru puja, and one of our devotees, whose name was Ambarish, he was a uh, cowherd boy. He led the guru puja kirtan. And uh, he finished the Guru Puja uh, right at the end and ended it. And then Pushta Krishna Maharaj, who was Prabhupada's servant, picked up her Dhammadanga and started to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. So we were wondering why that happened, because it seemed like the kirtan was over. Later on, we learned that Srila Prabhupada never liked to be worshipped separate than, than with Krishna. In other words, yeah, even in his Guru Puj Kirtans, we had to chant Hare Krishna because he felt that worship of the spiritual master must include worship of Krishna. So we learned from that experience. Because of my degree in theology, Prabhupada specifically wanted me to write theology. One, one very first morning walk with him, he said, uh, you must defeat them. And this is the rascal theologians who mislead and, uh, uh, innocent people, things like that. Uh, one particular morning on a 
group of morning walks January of 1974. It actually started December of 73. Prabhupada said, Theologian, you must write on the necessity of God. And I said, yes, Prabhupada. And then the next day he saw me and said, well, did you do it? So I went home r real quickly and wrote just something, you know, and, and I gave it to Prabhupada's servant. And the next day Prabhupada said, oh, very good. Now where will you have it published? So he really was pushing me in that, in that area. And they also in the theater area, we, the temple uh, in Bombay there, uh, Juhu Beach, has a big theater built, and Prabhupada wanted us there. One of his last requests to us was that we have a theater troupe that was based six months out of the year in India, there at the uh, Juhu, and then six months in the West doing Krishna Leela. One time we'd done a play for him here in Los Angeles called The Cry of the She-Jackal. It was actually the pond of his retired timely play. Prabhupada liked it very much. He blessed us that we were all going back to Godhead and then called us up to his quarters afterwards. And there he said, you must perfect this play. You don't need to do a lot of plays. Just take this one and one or two others. You can take it everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And other times in a letter about the theater and dance troupe, he said, they could have a party of about 15 people. They can go everywhere. And the, mm, some tickets can be sold, and, and therefore would cover the expenses. And, but he was very enthusiastic about Chaitanya Leela and Krishna Leela, stories from the Bhagavatam, as well as contemporary other plays dealing with philosophical issues being done as a, a, a part of the Hare Krishna cultural expansion. Another part of the letter that I uh, sent to Prabhupada, I had asked another question regarding how to use my scientific credentials in Krishna service. Having just received my master's degree from the University of Florida, I was interested in seeing how to blend both science and Krishna consciousness, or if there's some way to do that. Prabhupada's reply, he suggested something different than what I was anticipating. Uh, I had asked, in fact, perhaps we can make some experiments, such as based on Bhagavad Gita, where uh, Lord Krishna says that the, the light from the moon uh, supplies the juice to fruits. So I was suggesting that we can make some experiment like that, and then that way convince the scientists. Prabhupada replied that actually we're not so much interested in convincing the scientists, more we're interested in convincing the general public. He said the scientists... They have free will, and if they choose to remain atheistic, what can we do? He said, our main aim is to convince the innocent public that life comes from life and not from matter, as they so foolishly claim. He said, you just prove this, and it will be a very great victory. So uh, that, was, that was very instructive for me, because I could see Prabhupada had a very practical way of approaching things, uh, aiming at the mass of people, uh, rather than... Uh, now, of course, over the years, I've come to see how, in, especially in the university settings, many professors, uh, practically, it's, it's an academic requirement to be atheistic. So, very difficult to try to convince them of something other, otherwise. And then behind the art museum, Srila Prabhupada told us the story of how Krishna took the form of Jagannath. He said... Um, Krishna was listening, was walking through the halls in his palace in Dwarka one day, and he heard Rohini and Rukmini talking. And Rukmini said to Rohini, I heard Krishna sleeping last night. She said the name Radha, Radha, Radha. Who is Radha? And Rohini said, Oh, Radha is very special. And Radha Krishna relationship is very special. Let me tell you the story of Radha Krishna's relationship. And as soon as she started to tell the story, Krishna started to listen. And as Krishna listened, he became stunned. And he took the form of Jagannath with the big eyes and the big smile. And probably a big smile. And he's stunned. So a little bit later, uh, Subhadra came by. And she saw Krishna stunned in the hall. And she started to listen. And she became stunned. And she took the form of Subhadra, as we see in the deities, and Baladev the same way. And then probably gave this story that was very, I've always remembered this story, because there's another story, but this was a story that Prabhupada told us at Rathiatra. When I got to Boston, um, the Jagannath deities were badly cracked. And they were very large. And... Uh, so Satsrupa asked me to write to Prabhupada and ask him what we should do about it. 
So I did, and he, um, he said they should be put in the sea and that new deities should be carved. And also I asked him at the time, Lord Jagannath wasn't being, his clothes weren't being changed at night. So I wrote to Prabhupada and asked him if Lord Jagannath could wear pajamas <laughs> at night. And he wrote back and said, yes, that would be very nice. Also, another time when I was in uh, Hawaii, um, I went directly to Prabhupada and I said, Prabhupada, I don't want to stay here. I said, these devotees don't like me. I don't want to go. I'm having trouble. And I just want to, I just want to get out of here. And Prabhupada said, no, you will stay. I'm like, I want to go, Prabhupada. No, no, you will stay. He said, depend on Krishna, and Krishna will save you. Depend on Krishna, and Krishna will save you. So somehow or other, I wound up in Hawaii, and I had been, I'd been praying. Uh, of course, this was in 1976, and I didn't realize that Prabhupada was obviously going to leave his body in 1977, but I had been praying. Uh, I would like, love to do some direct service with Srila Prabhupada. I just praying for that direct service. So uh, Hari Sari came to my office and he said, uh, Prabhupada wants one of those Coleman stoves, Coleman burner. And I said, uh, what for? He said, well, Prabhupada's going to cook his own prashadam. And I'm, you know, why would Prabhupada cook his own prashadam? We have so many devotees here, no one's sincere enough to cook directly for Prabhupada. He said, well, the girl who's been doing this service, she's adding too much salt. Prabhupada told her, and she's still continuing. So therefore, now he's going to cook his own. I said, "Well, you know, even though I'm president, I, you know, because as soon as Prabhupada would go somewhere, immediately the whole movement and the unlimited activity." So I said, "Well, you know, even though there's a, um, you know, so much going on, I'll cook directly for Prabhupada. I'll cook." So first day I made prasad, and of course, you know, there's no instruction. Here you are. You have to cook for the spiritual master of the universe, and you have no instructions. So it was like, uh, you know, I cooked, and I asked Hari Sari, who was his personal servant at that time, you know, how was the prashadam? And he said, uh, Prabhupada said, everything was good, but the doll, it was untouchable. So immediately I'm, I was in shock. And I asked Hari Sari, well, you know, what has to be done? He, the, the way that Prabhupada wanted the doll cooked was completely merged. There is no beans, just completely all soup. So I said, well, you know, no problem. So I fixed the prashadam next day, and I said, uh, you know, how was the prashadam? And Hari Sari said, Prabhupada said, everything is perfect. So just by hearing Prabhupada saying everything was perfect, I just, I've never felt such intense happiness, and I wanted to, to run outside and just jump up and down. I mean, I just remember feeling so much ecstasy in that Prabhupada said that everything is perfect. And he gave me some wonderful instructions, and uh, <laughs> which naturally I, I treasure very much, and I try to follow it as much as I can, regarding translation. He told me there are two ways of translating. One is a literal translation, literal, you know, word, and, he, and the other is bhavartha. I mean, he, ex, he expressed that particular word in, in English, in Sanskrit or Bengali. And he told me, capture the spirit, because these are f uh, very deep, uh, spiritual and devotional writings which convey the, the spiritual devotional mood of the authors because of all acharyas. So he said, I personally prefer this bhavartha to translate the spirit and mood of their writings rather than the literal translation. He said, you read it, read the original Bengali, or Sanskrit or whatever, Hindi, 
understand it, and then formulate it in your own words. He insisted, in your own words, you formulate it and write it. And I think uh, on one occasion, uh, Satsurup Maharaj was there. And he told Satsurup Maharaj that you should edit this book. This is a very important book, and it truly is. BBT did print that. It's now uh, it, it's entitled uh, with, uh, Renunciation Through Wisdom. And it's, it's an incredible book. It's a gradual you know, unfolding of the philosophy uh, and purport of Bhagavad Gita. And uh, Prabhupada just excelled himself in, in the sense that uh, the writing, <coughs> the original Bengali, was very scholarly. Uh, he, when he wrote in English, he tried, I think, uh, to do it in a very simple manner. But in his Bengali writing, I think he purposely wanted to be very scholarly and erudite presentation. So the translation was uh, quite a challenging you know, proposition. And so he would ask me to come every single day. This was in Vrindavan, uh, while he was in Vrindavan. To read to him, he would have the Bengali, and I would have to read the English translation that I had done, and uh, and he liked it, I must say, and uh, that made me very happy. It made me very blissful. I remember we went out with Prabhupada, and you know, as is common, some man said "Buenos dias" in Spanish to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada asked Sri Dayananda Maharaj, "What? What is he saying?" He said, oh, this is, this is a good day in Spanish. And so, and so Prabhupada said, ah, buenos dias, in Spanish, he said that. So Prabhupada began, to, began his Spanish speaking at that point, you know, <laughs> ah, buenos dias, he said. <laughs> so you didn't know Prabhupada spoke Spanish, did you? Eh? Well, you see the new thing? <laughs> ah, buenos dias. I was very surprised. I was very impressed. But he said it in the... Correct pronunciation was perfect, you know. He was a great linguist, Prabhupada. And then I remember while Prabhupada was here, what he said on the Vyasa Sun. One time he said, don't use this philosophy like a knife. He said, this philosophy is very strong. And you can use it like a knife. You can cut. You can cut with this. He said, do not use this philosophy like a knife. Another time Prabhupada said, Jumping, 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 just like a monkey, over the head of your spiritual master. You'll all become monkeys in Vrindavan for deviating from the order of the spiritual master. And that, Prabhupada said. Prabhupada had seen a Bhagavad Gita dance and a Pralambasura dance that we'd done here in Los Angeles, said we must come to India for the opening of the Krishna Balaram Mandir. Um, so when we got to Mayapur, we'd done one drama, and the way the audience was set up, where Prabhupada's Vyasa, we had end up with our backs to the deities. Now, earlier, we had been told that was not acceptable, that the deity door should be closed, and so we had some argument with the authorities, but since they were GBC, we were just lowly little dancers and actors, we did it. So Prabhupada didn't see the performance, but he saw the pictures. So we were up in his quarters, and he was looking at the photographs of the performance, and he said, oh, you know, back should not be to the deity, and so we tried to Instead of just saying, yes, Prabhupada, we, should, we tried to explain that we were told, yes, Krishna is all pervasive, therefore we d it was okay if we had our backs to him. Prabhupada got furious. He said, well, Krishna is all pervasive? Then you should dance on the roof. Sorry. Got an very animated there. <laughs> uh, uh, other uh, wonderful things uh, he had to say about our plays uh, in New York, once, of course, we did the Krishna Rukmini play. They said, this was better, th these plays are better than reading my books. And, and, phew, which was, because we bring the books to life. And then they, they should be brought to life, of course. I got very little association from Prabhupada, but I did go on a morning walk one time. 
and I was in Central Park with Prabhupada. And there were many devotees. I was way in the back. And Prabhupada said one thing that I can remember. He was talking about, you know, how this materialistic civilization, everybody is just rushing around different ways. He says the the man he's running on four tires and the dog is running on four legs. So what's the difference? No difference. Same business, just running. And running for what? Sense gratification. So I, that's practically the only thing I can remember on a morning walk. I was way in the back. I was listening to the class, and it was right in the middle of the class, and Prabhupada was giving Saying, speaking a, a sentence, and I realized by the way he was forming the sentence that he was going to say something incorrectly, in, in, gram, grammatically incorrect. And my mind said, just see, you know, he's going to say something grammatically incorrect, and he's a perfect master. And then Prophet stopped. He didn't say the sentence. He looked right down at me, even though there's 300 people in a room. Looked right down at me. He looked back up. He said the whole sentence perfectly, and then he looked down at me and went like this. And I just, uh, I just melted into the floor. And I thought, that couldn't have just happened like I thought it happened. <laughs> I can't be, you know, I hope he really didn't know what I thought, what I was thinking. And I just prayed that Prabhupada really didn't know what I was thinking. You know, but it, it was amazing, you know, that I thought, wow, Prabhupada is the perfect master. <laughs> he really knows. Prabhupada not only just said, not only would say that you have to become like the bumblebee and like, not like the fly, but Prabhupada proved it. Uh, Narayan Orion, who is, a lot of people know in Los Angeles, he was in the temple room singing, and everyone knows, well maybe not everyone knows, but a few of us who are in the know know that he does not sing like a nightingale. So he was in the temple room singing, and uh, Prabhupada said, uh, who, who's that singing? And uh, Karanda said, oh, it, it's uh, Narayan Narayan Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, hmm, he keeps very good time. <laughs> yes. So Prabhupada didn't come out directly and said, you know, he sings like a frog. Mm -hmm. He keeps very good time. <laughs> so. Earlier that morning in the temple, like I said, it was a very old house. It's not the temple that they now have in Boston. It was on uh, North Beacon Street. And um, there was some hooks. There was the men's restroom was on one over here and the ladies over here. And there was a couple hooks on the wall in between. And uh, Prabhupada was going into the men's room, and he noticed some japa beads hanging on one of these hooks. And he took those beads, and he said, these beads are crying. They should never be here next to the storeroom. They should always be around your neck or in a bead bag. But it was uh, when he said, these beads are crying, it, um, I think it was a, a really important lesson about how sacred these <laughs> beads really are. So then he came to the doll studio, and he went through the doll studio, and he saw all the dolls, and he saw the changing body. And, and then he saw the changing body, and he said, from boyhood to youth to old age, the body changes, but the soul remains the same. He said, this is not a Hindu problem. It's not a Muslim problem or a Christian problem. This is a universal problem. So this Krishna consciousness movement will stop that, will stop this death business. He said, so this is a non-sectarian, not a religion. This is how to stop this birth, death, disease, old age problem. You know, and Prabhupada told us certain things. He went and we showed him the, his murti that Lochan Prabhu had made. And, and then the head moved, and Prabhupada, oh, he liked very much. And uh, then Prabhupada said, I will always be with you, and I will sit on the Vyasasana, and I'll always be there in, in my form on the Vyasasana. I will never leave. 
Now that you've done this, I will never leave. I will always be there. So Prabhupada told us, this form is him, and he will be there. Probably, uh, maybe September, not long after going to New Vrindavan, I asked Amarinder a question, that if Prabhupada's localized Jivatma, he's not Krishna Tattva, he's Jiva Tattva. So if Prabhupada's Jiva Tattva, how can he be expanded in so many pictures to receive the offerings? We offer all the boga and prayers to Prabhupada's picture. So I ask, how can Prabhupada be present in all these places to receive the offering? Jiva's localized. So he said, well, why don't you write to Prabhupada and ask him? And I, I was very pleased that he suggested that because at that time, uh, Prabhupada was, at least I didn't uh, want to try to burden him with any, any questions or anything. The movement was very large at that time, and I understood so many thousands of, of devotees. He couldn't possibly deal with everybody on one-on-one. -on -one. So when the opportunity came up to write to Prabhupada by the order of my, my temple president, I thought, okay, great, I'll do that. So I wrote to Prabhupada that question and, and several others as well. Uh, and the reply came back. It's in the Shikshamrita book uh, under uh, Spiritual Master section. And uh, it's also in the uh, archives, in, in, the, in the folio. The letter is dated December 1, 1973, letter to Bhakta Dan. And the reply to my question about Prabhupada being able to receive the offerings of Prasadam was Prabhupada said, Spiritual Master is present wherever the disciple is sincerely trying to follow his instructions. In all of your devotional sentiments and in all of your attempts to serve me, I am with you as my Guru Maharaj is with me. Remember this always. So this is... Um, Prabhupada, in his letters, sometimes he gave specific instructions to individuals and sometimes general instructions. I consider this to be a general instruction that Prabhupada, that applies not just to me, but to all the devotees. And the wonderful thing about this is, Prabhupada did not say, oh, in your successes and all your, uh, the, your accomplishments, no, he said, in all of your attempts and all of your de sincere devotional sentiments, I am with you. Uh, so this is a wonderful thing, and I... I do always remember it. And then one interesting thing on that morning walk, that very first one, Prabhupada asked us all a question. I didn't hear it very well, so I wasn't able to answer. He said, what if the mind wanted the eyes to see? What do you mean, the mind wanted the eyes to see? It wasn't until years later I understood the sun was rising, and we can't see without the help of the sun. Our eyes are completely dependent on the sunlight or some kind of electricity or something, or so, so inwardly also. The light of consciousness from the super soul per allows our eyes to see. So in that sense, we are totally dependent on Krishna. The necessity of God, one thing, is that we are totally dependent on Krishna. And Prabhupada proved that to us, that everything that we do, that we take for granted, just like seeing, is totally dependent on Krishna. We can't see independently. We can't do anything independently. So that is our disease. The maya exists not in the world around us, but as Prabhupada writes in the Krishna book and the prayers of Lord Brahma, the maya, the illusion, exists within our senses, our mind, and intelligence. So we walk around seeing through incorrect vision. When we have Krishna consciousness, we see this is all Krishna's energy. And so Prabhupada was not Krishna, but he was as close to Krishna as one could come as a living entity. He was totally transparent to Krishna, like maybe Jesus Christ or Muhammad or some other leader of some great religious movement. Uh, and I think there's a danger on one end to minimize Prabhupada and, and maximize somebody else, and the other is to elevate Prabhupada to being the Supreme Person. Instead, he's the Supreme Personality of Servitor Godhead, as he explains in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Then Prabhupada saw these uh, Gandharvas, and he said, what is this? And we said, these are Gandharvas. And Prabhupada says, uh, they, Gandharvas don't have wings. He said, only Garuda has wings. Of this, he is unique. You know, so we thought, oh, angels don't have wings. And, you know, so anyway, that's the way it was with Srila Prabhupada. You would learn things that, that you thought were some way, and Prabhupada said, no, they're not like this. One time, uh, Haris, uh, oh, yeah, sorry, his alarm clock went off. And uh, Prabhupada said, what is that sound? He said, oh, that's the alarm clock should have brought by. Prabhupada said, oh, who is in danger? <laughs>
And I remember looking at Hard Star and we were like, wow, our spiritual master has a sense of humor. We just couldn't believe it. We hadn't, because, you know, we never heard Prabhupada uh, use a play on words or puns or sarcasm. We, you know, Prabhupada didn't make a habit of it, but, you know, we were like, oh, who's in danger? Oh, we were just, we were just laughing. Our spiritual master has a sense of humor. Prabhupada said out of the four bodily activities, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, the most dangerous for a devotee is oversleeping. He said that was, he said that leads to the other ones. It's too, he said, first of all, too much sleep, you're actually wasting time. And that time could be, should be used for Krishna service. And also that enhances uh, the attraction for eating and for, you know, uh, mating. So, he qualified it also. So that was a shock. We were thinking something else. <laughs> you know, like one time I was uh, in Calcutta Temple in 76, and the Arati had just ended, and I was supposed to go and call Srila Prabhupada from his room. And... Uh, for the lecture, evening lecture, and the, the building, this where we have the temple, right? Still now we have it too today. Had these Venetian blinds, you know, the little slats, the wooden slats. So you, if you just slightly kind of pull that, you could see through it. So I was, before entering, I kind of peeped in, and the Nishinga prayers were going on, and there was Prabhupada sitting with his back to me. He had this small little garlands of uh, the small Radha Govindaji, they call Radha Govindaji. And he had them around his ears, and he was swaying his head and swinging them, and the, the garlands were also swinging, and he probably lied, I don't know what it was, he was totally absorbed in his you know, transcendental world. You know. But he immediately said, yes, please come in. I mean, and, I, and I, I don't think I really made any noise, you know. So, you know, that's Srila Prabhupada, you know, I mean, you could go on. It's just incredible that he was here and he was at the same time totally absorbed in, in Krishna. You know. We had stopped uh, in a, near, a, it was like a tank you know, a concrete tank, I think, of, uh, with two crocodiles in it. You know. And he probably knew which was the male and which was the female. He was able to distinguish. I don't know how, you know. But he was able to say, this is the male, he said. And had, just at that time, the man, the, he opens his huge mouth. And, and as he's doing this, he probably says, oh, no food. <laughs> but it was very nicely, just very, timing was just correct. And then he said, he is inviting us. <laughs> you know, Prabhupada's humor. And he would come about the birds, uh, the atmosphere of Vrindavan. And when he'd hear the Arctic going on in the temple, he'd say, he'd hear the Arctic and he'd say, this is the perfection of human life, to be a Bajari. He said, this is the highest service that one can perform as a human being, to be a Bajari. And then he said, because in the, with, a, with a material body, you're serving the Supreme Personality of Godhead. You're waking him up, you're bathing him, you're dressing him, you're feeding him. These are the actual activities that we are doing in the spiritual world. But in this world, you're doing this, actions. He said, so this is the perfection of, of, of human life. There's nothing higher than you can be but to be a Pajari. So then I just, you know, I had always heard from my god brothers that, you know, distributing books was the highest service, you know, which is a very elevated service. But Prabhupada was saying, you know, on the absolute platform, you know, the highest service is to serve Krishna eternally. And this is a way to actually serve Krishna eternally. So if you're a, if you're a Pujari, you've attained your constitutional position, even within a, a 
founded a, 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 a samsara, even within, uh, you're liberated. He's probably saying, this person is liberated. In fact, one, one time he told, was telling us how he stays Krishna conscious. He says, in my room, I have a madanga, so I can sit down and play it for a while. And when I get tired of that, I'll go over and do some translation. When I finish with that, I can go to the harmonium and sing a song. Then I have correspondence to do one activity after another, all connected to Krishna. Satsrupa and Sohotra and I did a, ro a radio show once a week at Northeast, either Northeastern or Northwestern University, whichever one's in Boston. It was a, quite a, a big radio station with a lot of people listening. And um, we would pick a story from Krishna book, and Satsrupa would write a little script. And then we would go to the station and do this dramatic thing that would be on the radio for an hour each week. And one time when Prabhupada was in New York, Satsrupa took him tapes of the last three or four shows that we had done. And Prabhupada, Satsrupa was always Krishna, Sohotra was whatever demon was in that story, and I was Mother Jasoda. And um, so it was the story of Kaliya, Krishna subduing the Kaliya serpent. And when Mother Jasoda is seeing Krishna like wrapped in the coils of Kaliya and she's just crying his name and just, just the most utmost desperation. So I was just, you know, really crying Krishna's name. And uh, Srila Prabhupada said to Satsrupa, um, stop the tape. He said, who is that? And Satsrupa said, that's um, Sumati. And Prabhupada said, you tell her to always cry for Krishna like that. So that's, that's my favorite <laughs> the story that I try to keep in my heart, even though I don't cry for Krishna like that. But, um... Another thing I remember, uh, let's see, in Caracas, I had, because Caracas when I, when I had most association with, wasn't many English-speaking devotees. So that sort of gave me a little more uh, an Indian man had come to see Prabhupada. He was a little, he was talking, you know, babbling on a lot of nonsense, you know. And Prabhupada told him, he said, one, one thing I want to say, tell you, while, you, while you are speaking, I am chanting Hare Krishna. And you could see Prabhupada his, you know, moving his hands. He was actually chanting. Kirtaniya Sadahari, constantly, always chanting Hare Krishna. So someone may say, well, Prabhupada, did he chant a fixed number of rounds, but Prabhupada was, was always chanting. So he said this like this. So then I understood that Prabhupada was always chanting, you know, Krishna's glories. You know. Even when this guy was speaking all sorts of nonsense, he was <laughs> maybe indirectly he was telling the guy, you are speaking nonsense, therefore I'm just chanting Hare Krishna, or something like that. Anyway, I, I took it on the, the both ways, but I understood that Prabhupada was always Chanting Hare Krishna. Krishna said, Prabhupada, what should I do with this bug? And I was thinking, who in the universe, who in this city of Hawaii, who in Hawaii can we go to to ask, what do you do with this bug? I mean, if you go to the, the mayor, of Hawaii, you go to the mayor, you go to the governor. Can you ask him, what do you do with this bug? He will look at you like you, you're just a crazy person. Why do you ask him? You squish him, do whatever. You cannot go to anyone, you can't go to the president of the United States and ask him, what do you do with this bug? But here he was, he was asking this question to Prabhupada, and Prabhupada didn't. His, he didn't look at him as if he was crazy. He didn't look at him like, you know, that this is something odd or bizarre. Prabhupada said, take him to the window. So Pusta Krishna goes over to the window and lets the bug out the window. Prabhupada said, this is Vaishnav. A Vaishnava is kind to every living entity. 
not the squishing business. So we were immediately amazed that as Prabhupada went to do this bug. Prabhupada made it a Krishna conscious event. That uh, yeah, this is Vaishnava. A Vaishnava is kind to every living entity, not this squishing business. Then uh, we were walking. He stopped in front of some stool was there. And he said, uh, they think that the dry stool, that's better. Wet stool is not so bad. So similarly, they say, dying a violent death is not so good. That's not good. But it's quiet. Then. That's a very, very good thing. So you're saying like that. Prabhupada's position, you know, after you were with Prabhupada for a while, you got used to Prabhupada's uh, physical condition that was so devastating when you first saw. So we would be around Prabhupada's bed, and then new devotees would come in, and as they first saw Srila Prabhupada, they'd start crying, and it would be so pathetic that we'd all start crying, to see these devotees crying when they first saw Srila Prabhupada. So we'd all started crying. And then Prabhupada said, he, he, at one point he says, why are you all crying? <laughs> so he said, Srila Prabhupada, we're crying because you're so sick and we're afraid that you may leave. And Prabhupada said, I will never leave you. He said, I live forever in my books. I will never leave you. I will live forever within my books. So there's no reason to cry. He said, Old people's cry, that is, old people die, that is natural. He said, when a young person dies, that's some mistake. Because young person should live to their old. When they're old, they should die. And that's for me, it's natural. It's a natural thing, so don't cry. So then one devotee said, but Srila Prabhupada, we're crying because we can't be without you. And when you leave, we won't know how to communicate with you. And Prabhupada said, oh. I will communicate with you through your heart. He said, I will come to you in your dreams as Chaita Guru. You, I will communicate with you through dreams, Prabhupada said, as Chaita Guru. I also found that a little controversial because I thought my god brothers wouldn't have approved, but Prabhupada had said it. <laughs> Prabhupada said it right there that he would communicate with us through dreams. And then, um, at times, Prabhupada would say, you know, you're all, your mothers are all very good. You all have very good mothers. He said, yes, all you boys have very good mothers. And we go, but our mothers, are, you know, they're meat eaters. <laughs> and Prabhupada said, because the uh, qualities of the son, uh, they come from the mother. He said, so you're all such good devotees, so I know you have such good mothers. And Prabhupada would compliment us. And Prabhupada said, you know, my Guru Maharaj, he left his body out of disgust for his disciples, not following his order. He was disgusted. So he left out of disgust. He said, but I'm not disgusted with you. I'm very satisfied with you. Never think that I'm not happy with you, Prabhupada said. I'm very pleased with my disciples. Prabhupada said this, and he said, and I'm very happy to have your association. You're a very good association. <laughs> you know, really? <laughs> but, you know, that's because Prabhupada had trained us in such a way to, uh, in Krishna consciousness, and he was seeing us as good association. I was brand new. I just loved, I had been chanting for two years because I had heard it on the mantra on the radio as a part of the musical hair. I never saw devotees, didn't know there was such a thing as a devotee. I didn't even know Krishna was the name of God. It was just my favorite song. As soon as I heard it, I just loved the song and I sang it all the time. So we came to New Vrindavan and I, I was just lost. I felt very, I didn't know anyone. There was only... Uh, my only association in, in Washington was the four or five brahmacharis that lived there. So once we got to New Vrindavan, I was on my own. 
And um, I remember sitting in a Bhagavad Gita class. Uh, do you remember that devotee Ishan? Ishan was giving Bhagavad Gita class. And he was saying, all I remember was he said, if you don't, if you want some service to do and you, know, you don't have any and you're not sure what to do, just pray to Prabhupada and he'll send you some. So later that day, I was sitting outside under a tree trying to read Bhagavad Gita, but I, I did just, I, I couldn't understand it. And so I was just sitting there and then I suddenly remembered what Ishan had said. So I just in my mind said, Srila Prabhupada, could you send me some service to do, please? And instantly, this woman walked up to me and, and said, uh, there's going to be three weddings tonight. Um, could you go over into that field and pick flowers? And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to. And I honestly felt like Srila Prabhupada was walking beside, I mean, it was almost like I could see him, but I, I felt his presence. Like, it, it was, to me, it was very, very mystical and miraculous because I really, at that time, had no sense of Prabhupada or Krishna or any of it. It was just all so new. But I, I knew that he was there. And um, it was very powerful and very loving and wonderful. And, um... This was the morning after Prabhupada saw one of the dance programs that I had narrated. And the, the girls had acted out the Bhagavad Gita for Columbus or one of those. So the next day, Prabhupada was on a walk and they were making, taking them on a tour of the BBT warehouse. And I remember that just after an incident where one of the guys with the forklift had run into the, the lights at the top and they were apologizing. Prabhupada, he's not used to, of course, everybody was nervous around. And then Prabhupada started talking about the performance. And he said, let them dance only, let them paint only, whatever they love to do, let them do that for Krishna. That is the most important thing. So he was, it came with this one, little, one of those little books uh, that have come out with the um, tape, you know, the conversation. But it's a, uh, I was, a, I wasn't there, but then I got to hear, hear about, oh, Prabhupada was talking about the plays and how, you know, he really loved it and like that. Prabhupada liked the system of having a narrator or the drama or the dance, so that we could do this in any language. The dancers wouldn't have to learn Spanish or Russian or whatever. You'd have a narrator doing it in that language, telling the story. Meanwhile, the actors or dancers just act it out. Now, both we did the Bhagavad Gita dance twice for Prabhupada, and both times, after the first time he saw it, he said there should be projections. You know, if they're talking about the, the sage in the forest, then we see that picture or that thing you know, behind. And then this next time we did it, we, for a while, we had tried to get a slideshow and projections together. And then a year or two passed. By the time we did it again, again, we didn't have the projections. And Prabhupada mentioned the same point. So obviously, that was something he thought was important. If you do a Bhagavad Gita thing, instead of just saying Krishna and Arjuna, you see the things that they're talking about. Prabhupada was there in the temple room, and uh, Prabhupada was sitting up on stage, and to Prabhupada's right was Lord Jagannath. So we were having, it was on La Cienega Boulevard. And uh, at the end of the class, some Christian was there, and he was speaking some uh, nonsense philosophy. And Prabhupada wasn't even looking at him. Prabhupada was just simply sitting there, and he would look over at Lord Jagannath. <laughs> and look back. I mean, it's like the guy wasn't even, even existing. But Prabhupada was listening to everything that he said. And then Prabhupada looked at him and he said, Christ said, Thou shalt not kill. Why are you killing? At that time, I was a new devotee and, of course, a meat eater. But Prabhupada talked like that. It scared the meat eating right out of me. And everyone in that temple room was frozen. And the Christian, he had, there was nothing for him to say. 
He had plenty of time to say something. He had plenty of time to respond. There was nothing to say. Christ said, thou shall not kill. And Papa just didn't say it. He screamed it. He didn't say it. He screamed it. Christ said, thou shall not kill. Why? And the potency coming from Prabhupada saying that was immediate. There was no, 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 no philosophy that you had to learn. There was nothing that you had to retain or absorb. Prabhupada was so powerful. When he said that, your realization was immediate. You would never think of eating meat again in front of Sri Prabhupada. And his speaking like that was just like if, you, if there was a tree and if there's a cold wind and if there's a few leaves left. I mean, it was like a few leaves getting completely blown off a tree. Papa blew all the nonsense right out of that person. And anyone else there was convinced not ever to eat meat. We'd gone to see Prabhupada about the dance troupe, and he told me to talk some little about what he, the principles of the dance and the drama. Next day, he asked me to come back, and he wanted to talk about theology. So he called in, call all the sannyasis in here. So all these guys were, what's going on? <laughs> Crowd into Prabhupada's room, and he started talking about Christianity and Krishna consciousness. He says, for the Christians, if they want to worship Jesus, they, all they have to do is have two altars. One altar where Jesus is worshipped, and one altar of Radha and Krishna. And I said, Prabhupada, that didn't seem, would it, it would be better if they had the altar of the Lord Jesus and then one to you. Prabhupada was, again, <laughs> in his modesty, uh, you know. But the, my thought was, well, Prabhupada's in the same category as Lord Jesus Christ. He is the guru for the world. Then there was the lawyers also, which I, I taped, filmed that also. They were a lawyer, one with a beard, I think you see. That's also in Caracas. Prabhupada was uh, preaching to them about uh, responsibility, that uh, the difference between state law and the laws of nature, and how in the state laws, sometimes you will not be convicted of something you do. But in the natural law, the law of nature, you kill an ant, and you will be processed. You know, that was his he was saying like that you know, to these lawyers. I remember one point um, Krishnas Babaji had come in. Uh, um, this, he was a, a great devotee. Um, a Kinshina Krishnadas Babaji. Uh, Prabhupada's god brother. Um, always jov jovial and laughing. He came in and uh, Prabhupada would speak Bengali with him a lot of the time. But I remember when he first came in, Prabhupada said to him, Babaji Maharaj, just look at my disciples. See how advanced they are. See how much they love me so much. See how attentive they are to me. And every word, they're just there to listen. Every word I say, they're just listening to every word. They're so obedient. And they're so devoted to me. See how advanced they are. And then Babaji Maharaj said, yeah, they are advanced. And I said, I'm just thinking, well, I couldn't understand <laughs> advanced. Then later, you know, for many years, these things that happened in Prabhupada's room, I would re, uh, remember them in my head, you know, and I would say, in different sections, I would remember this and that part. And then I kept remembering that part. Prabhupada said we were advanced, but these were two Paramahamsas, and I'm so full of material desires. You know, my mind was just filled with all kinds of nonsense in those days, and even, even worse than now, you know. But Prabhupada was saying we were advanced, and I couldn't understand. But then I remember, Prabhupada said, why were they advanced? They were so attentive to me. They love me so much. They're so devoted to me. They want to please me so much. They're listening to every one of the words that I say. So then I realized, oh, that's advanced devotee. Advanced devotee is the one who's the most attentive to Srila Prabhupada, 
who was so devoted to Prabhupada, who listened to his every word. This is advanced devotee. This, to me, is the, uh, that, 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 uh, what Prabhupada was teaching me, and you know, in teaching us all, but to me, that's what it meant. And it took me many years to understand this. Many years. One time Prabhupada was talking about determination. This was here in New Vrindavan. So one devotee asked him, Prabhupada, what happens if we have no determination? Prabhupada said, then you're an animal. He says, an animal cannot be determined for anything. As soon as they hear a little sound, they, they run in fear. So... No determination means it's animal life. So you must have determination, otherwise you can't execute Krishna consciousness. So he made that point clear. Strong statement. He, that was the first words he said, you are an animal. I mean, that, you can't become determined. Then another time, Srila Prabhupada, um, at one time, when lots of devotees were there, especially um, the uh, people that Prabhupada called uh, Ridvik Acharyas, transparent to the previous Acharya, I never heard Prabhupada refer to the 11 that he was going to ask to initiate um, as gurus, but Prabhupada called them Ridvik Acharyas, transparent to the previous Acharya. You know, that's what Srila Prabhupada said. Now, these devotees who say this or that thing, one's like a right and left now. <laughs> there's a right, a, a right group, there's a right, uh, right wing devotees and there's left wing devotees. But Srila Prabhupada had called it Rigvik Acharya transparent to the previous Acharya. And uh, he said, uh, he would often say, he would, he would talk about this. To, to the devotees, to, to Goswami Maharaj, to Bhavananda, to Sasarup. He was very long time about what he wanted them to do, how to initiate, how to carry on. And it was everyone's understanding that those disciples would be their disciples. And I was very surprised to see in, in that letter, that July 9th or 7th letter, that Prabhupada was soon to be, the, they were going to enter Prabhupada's book, you know, of disciples, because Prabhupada was, it seemed while I was in the room that these were going, the new people were going to be uh, the, the, the Marga brothers' disciples, and Srila Prabhupada would be grandfather guru. He even said that word, he would be grandfather guru. And, you know, there was recordings going on all the time. As soon as Prabhupada spoke, they would turn the recording off, the recorder on, and then they turn it off. It's not that Prabhupada spoke like he did in good health. Prabhupada was mostly just sitting there quietly, almost sleeping. It would appear, resting. But as soon as Prabhupada would speak, the, the recorder was right by his head, and they just hit the on switch. So that's why when you hear those tapes, it is clicking on and off. I, I think I was just most struck, and, and I'm still struck always by his love for Krishna and his faith and his just I, I wouldn't know how else to say it just his his absolute surrender and love for Krishna that I I would hear in his voice when he spoke of Krishna I mean, on one level, I was very much afraid of Prabhupada because, you know, he was also very stern and, and you know, the devotees were just very, very strict and about the rules and regulations and I was always a little frightened. <laughs> but at the same time, whenever, whenever Prabhupada would specifically talk about Krishna, um, there was so much love in his voice that it just gave me faith in Krishna that Krishna was actually real, real. and um, you know that faith continues to increase and I I feel so grateful to Prabhupada I'm not a you know a, 
a really good disciple anymore. But I thank him every day for my life and that Krishna is in my life and that all of my most intimate friends are all devotees of Krishna. And uh, I hope that someday I'll again be a, a good disciple, a good daughter. So Prabhupada wanted to go to Govardhan. So he said, I want to go to Govardhan. And everyone's saying, Srila Prabhupada, we don't think this is a good idea, you know. And Prabhupada said, in this room, in this room, it's like being killed by Ravana. He said, uh, uh, he said, Marichi, Marichi. He said, uh, he was given the choice to be, if he didn't become a deer and go and, and tempt Ram away from Sita, Ravana would kill him. And if he became a deer, Ram would kill him. So he told Ravana, better to be killed by Ram. So Ravana says, better to be killed by Ram, better to go to, to Govardhan. If I stay in this room, it's like being killed by Ravana. So he said, but Prabhupada, you can't go. You know, the doctor said, Prabhupada, you won't even make it to the, to the gate. If we carry you, you won't even make to the gate. So there was a big discussion right around Prabhupada's bed. And Prabhupada said, you have to do this outside. I cannot, you know, it's too exhausting to hear this going on. It went on for maybe 15 minutes of discussion right in front of Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, you go outside. So they went into Prabhupada's garden. And they had a big, big discussion. I was just talking to Bard Thrush about this. Went on and on and on. It seemed, I only remember, one person for, on Prabhupada's side and everybody against Prabhupada, and I was on the side against. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj seemed to be the one who was on the side not to take Prabhupada to Govardhan, and Hamsa Duda was the only one, and Lokanath, who went to get the cart, were on Prabhupada's side to take him to Govardhan. So this went on and on and on until the cart came to the Krishna Balaram gate. Then we hear the cart's here. Now it's time to move Prabhupada from the bed to the cart. And, oh, and it's night. It's getting dusk. I mean, not only are we going to put Prabhupada on the cart, uh, uh, which is probably going to kill him, but it's going to be at night. So it'd even be worse, you know. So... Prabhupada would want to go, no one would see, it would be at night, he would go and he would leave his body somewhere and, you know, this is what we feared. So we all went in, and, and myself included, we all went around Srila Prabhupada's bed and we said, Srila Prabhupada, please, please don't make us put you on this cart. <coughs> please don't make us put you on this cart. <coughs> and Prabhupada said, mm, he didn't say anything. And then we begged him, we begged him, and we were almost crying. We were crying. And then Prabhupada said, if it worries you so much, I don't need to go. And it's just like the whole anxiety level just went from a, a, a 50,000 to back to zero, you know. <sighs> and, then, and then everyone just, it was just like, oh, now we can relax. And then people started moving out of Prabhupada's room, you know. And it seemed like most of the people were out of the room. There weren't many people in the room. But I was still there, and I don't think there were many other people in the room. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj, I'll tell you this. I worked with him after Srila Prabhupada left for seven years. You know, Siddhanta, how much I worked with him, how close I was with him. And uh, why I worked with him was because I was so impressed at the excellent service that he gave Srila Prabhupada. You know, if you had everyone, even people who didn't like Tamal Krishna Maharaj, they saw how Prabhupada, how he served Prabhupada, and we were impressed that no one could have served him like this. You know, so, but because Goswami Maharaj was also very, cl very intimate to Prabhupada, he got very fried towards at this situation, 
and he went up to Prabhupada and he said, you know, Prabhupada, I'm this, we can't understand why you do this. Why you insist for us to take you to Govardhan. We get so upset, we work out, so worked up, and we just get this cart, and we bring it over here, and then we're so worried, we put you on the cart, we're going to die, we get flipped out, and it becomes, we become more protective of you, even more than before, and we just, I'm just about, I just can't take it, Prabhupada. Why do you do this? And he almost screamed at Prabhupada. And then Prabhupada said, it's my duty. Joshua said, what? He said, it's my duty to make, you, to make you love me more. And Goswami said, oh, and walked away. And I just remember Prabhupada saying that, to make you love me more. And whatever love I had for Prabhupada just multiplied like a thousand times. You know, he probably just made you love him so much. If you were with Prabhupada, whatever love you had for Prabhupada, he just increased it, and you just become more and more loving with him. His duty, he said, was to make us love him more. What wonderful duty. <laughs> we already love Prabhupada, but he's trying to, he's getting us to love him more. The thing that stands out mostly in my mind about Srila Prabhupada is, as Prabhupada would use the word assuredness, or we might say certainty or conviction. When he said something, it wasn't like he was, you know, hypothesizing or theorizing. It was, this was it. And the, when, the, when he said it, there was that you could understand that this was the truth. His purity came through with his message. But at the same time, he was... This is it. It's not, a, it's not a question of can be argued. It, this is it. Yeah. And I was convinced by his conviction. That's, I think that's what really impressed me the most, how convinced he was. And, he, and his purity of, uh, as a pure, uh, pure devotee of the Lord. I mean, just when he said something, with his conviction and his purity, just, I mean, what else could you say? We were just convinced. That would that was to me the most. Um, yeah. And that's the most outstanding th quality that I can remember that really attracted me to Prabhupada, his conviction. Because most of the time when you hear philosophers or people speak, there's a certain sense of, you know, uncertainty. Or if they're not uncertain, and they're speaking more or less and try, either trying to convince themselves at the same time while they're trying to convince you at the same. Yeah. I, and so, well, Prabhupada wasn't like that. It was just, this is the way it is, and this is it. I like that. And that impresses me when someone speaks like that, and then I'm attracted to that. And when Prabhupada did it, it was, it was so powerful. Mm. Therefore, I had no problem uh, in anything he's, he did or said. I never questioned anything. As I could see this is, this is a unique personality. Srila Prabhupada, at one point, uh, he had all the devotees in the room. Uh, Bhava Nanda was there. I remember uh, Giri Raj Maharaj had come in from Nepal, I think. Um, uh, Jai Bhattaka Maharaj was there, Sasarut Maharaj was there, Jai Adwaita Maharaj was there. He was a brahmachari. Puncher Devidam, who's now Janardhan Maharaj with uh, Govinda Maharaj's group. And, uh, and Sridhar Maharaj's, uh, his, 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 uh, his mat. And uh, they were all there. And um, Prabhupada said, uh, at one point he said, of my disciples, I see no one who has my qualities. No. And then he said, but if I look at this or that one, some qualities I see. And if I look at a group of them, some percentage of my qualities are certainly there. He said, so I think that this movement can, I have some hope that this movement can continue on. He said, and so the test of your love for me will be shown at how well you work together. You know, and this I felt was like, Prabhupada saying that no one person was going to be, but the, group, the GBC was that group of devotees. Together, we would have a percentage 
a percentage of Srila Prabhupada's qualities. Even the GBC, together, it only a percentage of Srila Prabhupada's qualities. This I heard from Prabhupada himself. So within the GBC, we have a percentage of the qualities of Srila Prabhupada. So we have some hope that this society will go on. And we see for 30 years, it has gone on. And uh, it will go on. So uh, then Prabhupada uh, said, of his sannyas disciples that he had given sannyas to, he said that um, if they fall down after he leaves, they can never be given sannyas again. He said, if you do, their fall down will go on forever. He said, so if a sannyasi falls down, they can never be given back. He said, only I can do this. Prabhupada said, only I can reinstate them. You cannot reinstate. So this was an order Prabhupada gave. And then Srila Prabhupada said that, uh, I think all this happened in the same day as the order that I'm saying it. Then Prabhupada said that he wanted $1 million put in a fixed account. He said, I want $1 million put in a fixed account, and I want that money never to be withdrawn, and the interest on this money will go to renovate the holy places of Lord Chaitanya's pastimes, those that are... Gupta and Lupta, those that are covered or lost. We want them revealed and brought back. So then they said, Srila Prabhupada, um, which ones? The ones in Bengal, the ones in, in Bangladesh, or the ones in Orissa? Which ones first? Prabhupada said, the ones in Bengal first. He said, but before that, before we do any of this renovation of these holy places, I want that my god brothers, Mott, Sridhar Maharaj, I want my god brother, Sridhar Maharaj, with Mott, finished. He said, because he's worked his whole life to establish this Mott, Sri Chaitanya Saraswati Mott. He said, I want, this, I want this finished because I, before he dies, I said, I want him to see this. So before we start renovating these holy places, that money should go to him first. So this was uh, 76, 77, uh, March, April, after the Gold Purnima festival, Prabhupada comes to Bombay. And uh, we, were, we all heard that Srila Prabhupada was not very well. So we was, at, at that time, the Bombay temple, of course, had opened. And uh, work was still going on in the two in the Twin Towers, what is now the guest house, and Prabhupada's quarters were there in, the, in the, one of the uh, towers, in fact, the right-hand tower. And uh, so we all went in front of the gate to greet Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada's car came, and um, I just took the opportunity and hopped in to the front. <laughs> there was the one little place there. And Srila Prabhupada was there, and Gopal Krishna Maharaj, and uh, Surabhi Maharaj. He was the architect, and, and I think uh, Hari Sauri Prabhu was also there. So we were, I was sitting in the front, but I was kept looking back, and Srila Prabhupada just sat there. He was already a little, uh, his features were a little drawn, you know, he was, he was uh, unwell. And... Uh, so when we were passing the Twin Towers, Prabhupada just looked to the right and he saw it pass and didn't say anything. And then again, looked straight forward. And we came and stopped in front of his old quarters. It was in one of these two-story buildings where the BBT was housed at that time. And uh, as soon as the car came to a stop, we all hopped out, opened the dicky took out his luggage, and Prabhupada just sat in the car where he was. And there was a flurry of you know, activities, taking everything up. And so when all Prabhupada's luggage and everything was uh, taken up, uh, Surabhi or one of the devotees, I don't remember who it was, informed Prabhupada, Prabhupada, all your luggage is already upstairs, you may come. So he said, this is not my place. 
I don't, this is not my house. My quarters are there in the Twin Tower. Why did you bring me here? So <laughs> it was a little embarrassing for uh, Saurabhi Maharaj because his quarters were not complete. So he came hedging and hawing and, you know, wringing his hands, Prabhupada, this, that, and said, no, I'm not going here. You promised me that this is going to be my quarters, take me there. And he remained seated, didn't, didn't raise his voice, didn't do anything, very calmly everything. So again, everybody went up, brought the things down, turned the car around, stopped in front of the guest house. And in those days, the elevator couldn't reach to the ground level. It wasn't, that section wasn't complete. So, but we had a palanquin, you know. So immediately a palanquin was brought, and there were two of us who carried Prabhupada to the first floor. And the elevator was already working from there. Prabhupada's quarters were, I think, on the fourth floor or the fifth floor, you know, one of them. So we all went up and, you know, when we entered, everybody, of course, the quarter otherwise was finished. The, uh, the, the marble floor needed to be polished and there was muck everywhere and the windows were not in place. And at that height, the sea, which is just about 50 meters or so away, you know, it was a strong sea breeze blowing and got a chair for Prabhupada and sat down and the Guru Puja and washing the feet, lotus feet was done there and the Guru Puja. So Saurabhi Maharaj took it upon himself to offer Guru Puja. Now he, he wanted to somehow the other, you know, kind of rectify or make amends for what he had thought he had, you know. But my goodness, <laughs> that day the luck wasn't with him because he couldn't light the lamp, because it kept blowing out. And he was fumbling, and anyhow, in the meanwhile, he had given orders to clear up the space on the other side. Finally, we were, he was able to you know, complete the Guru Puja, and by that time, Prabhupada's reception area, he had already cleaned up, laid out a little carpet, and a small table, and a sitting asana for Prabhupada, and Prabhupada quietly came and sat there. And I think uh, about most of the devotees were asked to leave, and I think about ten of us were left. You know, one of the senior devotees like Gopal Krishna Maharaj and Surabhi Maharaj, Giriraj Maharaj was there and all. At that time, he was Brahmachari, and some other devotees were there, and we all sat down, and we all knew that. Uh, we should expect the thunderstorm because you know I mean it was it was such a mess and you know sound and the windows were not it was not complete so we all sat there everyone hanging their head down and Prabhupada was sitting there Prabhupada was also hanging his head down and I think it must have been several minutes but it like it was drawn out the time you know had lost its you know kind of meaning and said pin up silence we were all expecting something so finally Prabhupada raised his head and he began to speak in a very soft voice actually tender not only that the, the volume of his voice was toned down but it was so much he said all of you he said that you're trying so hard to please this old man who gets irritated so fast. You know, I'm old and on top of that I am unwell. So little things irritate me. But all of you are so tolerant, you know. For about ten minutes, he just went on like this. And I tell you, I thought I was the only one who was crying. But when I looked around, everyone had tears in their eyes, you know, including Prabhupada. You know. And it was so sweet, it was so wonderful. You know. you know, how can you you know not love a person like this? You know, this is one of the most uh, beautiful experiences I had.
Then another time I remember in the room, Srila Prabhupada uh, would talk about his godbrothers, and he said, uh, I am the only son of my Guru Maharaj. He said, I'm the only son. He said, the son inherits the business of the father. And he said, and I'm the only, of my godbrothers, I'm the only one who has inherited the business of my father. He said, the rest of my godbrothers are all like daughters because the daughters stay within the house of the spiritual master, of the, of the father. They don't get the business. They stay within the father's house. So they're all daughters. He said, but Prabhupada only had one son. My guru, Maharaj, only had one son, and that is me. He said, so I'm the only son of my guru, Maharaj. All my godbrothers are daughters. And then he said, uh, he said, the Gaudiya Math deviated so much from my spiritual master, from our spiritual master, he said. But, he said, there's still the best representatives of Lord Chaitanya on this planet next to me. <laughs> so next to Srila Prabhupada, they were the best. <laughs> he said, first is Prabhupada, then it's the Gaudiya Math. That's how Prabhupada saw it. But at this time, Prabhupada was talking to Shrup Damodar, and he said that there are four kinds of birth. There is birth from the egg, there's birth from sweat, there's birth from the womb, and there's birth from the seed. He said, so there's four kinds of birth, but sciences are saying that life is coming from a combination of chemicals. But Prabhupada is saying they're coming in four ways, through seeds, through sweat, through the womb and through um, eggs. This is the, life is coming from life, he pressed this point. He said, the scientist, he said, cannot understand Bhagavad Gita. He said, the scientist cannot understand the verse from Bhagavad Gita, Brahma, Bhuta, Prasanna, Atman, Nakam, Shati, Nakam, Shati. He says, they cannot understand that the Brahma, Bhuta person is self-realized. Self He's experiencing happiness from within. Even his body is completely destroyed. He is in ecstasy, he said. And then he says, I am that Brahma Bhutta, I am that Brahma Bhutta person. That's the last words Prabhupada said to us when he was speaking to us. I am that Brahma Bhutta person. Prabhupada was talking about his eternal color, bodily color. He said, my color is golden with a tinge of red. He told that story. But those were like practically back to back. So if we really, if we search the scriptures, we'll find that's Nityananda's color. Or Nityananda has gold, but he has like a red tint to the gold. So Prabhupada said that was his color. So, so I don't want to say anything beyond that. <laughs> but that was just he's what he said like that. Again, it was one of those moments. I remember one point Prabhupada said that he had always prayed his whole life. Now can you imagine such a thing? He had always prayed his whole life to be able to give up eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Can you imagine praying to Krishna, dear Krishna, please let me give up eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. Prabhupada said, I have always prayed my whole life to Krishna to give up eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. He said, now I've given up the defending and the mating. And by this disease, I've also given up the eating and the sleeping. So Krishna has finally answered my prayer. You know, and then he says, and now the smell is going. The smell, the sense of smell is gone. So that means death will come soon. He said, because when the smell goes, then death comes, goes, comes soon. And you cannot smell anymore. But, you know, can you imagine, you know, to pray to Krishna to give up these things? So this Prabhupada is saying, he was telling us, you know, he was revealing to us his true nature. He, would, had, he is completely free from eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. 
you know, the eating and the sleeping part is a little hard to give up, you know. And he did. Oh, oh, oh.